Well, I just, uh, I just returned last week from going to Alabama for spring break. My cousin lives down there, and we were able to spend time with her. And then we drove back, and driving from here to Alabama is a long drive, especially when you drive through Indiana this time of year. Indiana is the, it's the most exciting state I've ever driven through, just, <laughs> just the opposite. But as we're driving through Indiana, my son and daughter started getting into a very good conversation with me. My son asked me this question. He said, hey, Dad, I have a question for you. He said, let's say a person has come to Christ. They went to church for 20 to 30 years. After about 30 years, they get tired of going to church because they're sick of the people. Then they leave church. And not only do they leave church, but they quit following Christ altogether. Are they saved? He said, man, that's a tough question. I said, um, I don't know what's really in their heart, so I can't answer that. Then my daughter said, okay, Dad, i got a question for you. Seriously, what about the guy who lives in an island in the Pacific Ocean, never heard the gospel, was never preached to, and they die? Do they go to heaven? I said, well, hypothetically, no. I said, but that's too simple of an answer. I said, I really don't know what God has done in their life, and I don't know what's in their heart. About four days ago, I was watching, a, listening to a podcast, a Christian podcast, Somebody called the commentator on the podcast, and they said, I have a daughter, and I raised a daughter in a Christian home. I homeschooled my daughter. 18, she left my house. She got married to another woman, and now she is claiming to be a Christian. Is she? And the commentator said, well, I can't answer that, because not only do I not know your daughter, I don't know what's in her heart. A couple days ago, I was watching a political show. Two men were debating. One guy said, you know what? Because you're white, you have what's called unconscious bias, and you're privileged, and you don't see the world correctly. And the other guy said, you don't know me. That's extremely judgmental because you don't know what's in my heart. Can we assume things about other people simply because of the race they're from or the gender they are, or because they were raised in a Christian home? Can we assume things because somebody was baptized as a baby? From being in ministry for about 30 years, I have come to the conclusion that God does not ask me, primarily does not ask me ever to concern myself with what other people profess. What God wants is he wants to know what I profess. He wants to know me and what's in my heart and what's in your heart. He hasn't asked us to go around judging everybody, every community, every group. He wants to know, Chris, what do you believe? Because the truth of the matter, everything with Jesus is personal. And so if you can turn to Matthew chapter 16... We're going to look at verses 13 to 27, and we're going to see very, very specifically what is meant by this phrase, everything is personal. When I say everything is personal, I mean I'm specifically talking about when it comes to salvation, past, that's called justification, being declared righteous, present, sanctification, as I walk with Christ, and glorification when it comes to heaven, Honestly, everything's personal. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says it like this. Examine yourselves to see whether you, you in the singular, are in the faith. Test yourselves or do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail, you fail to meet the test. So we're going to begin in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. Everything with Jesus is personal. Verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 
Verse 15, then he said to them, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Knowing God and having a relationship with God is, it's really not about what group you are in. It has really nothing, believe it or not, to do with the traditions you keep on a regular basis. It's not about the information you know. I mean, we sang a song that's what I'd call very creedal, the I believe. I can give you creeds. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father, through him all, you know, all things are made. Because I can say that doesn't necessarily mean I know that. Just because I agree with some reformed confession of 1600s, that doesn't necessarily mean I know God. Knowing God is about personal intimacy and how you answer that question. Who do you, you, say I am? We have come to what I would call as the crux of the book of Matthew. You can look at it like this, kind of like a balance point. Everything up to this point now is going to start leaning down towards the cross. In fact, we start in verse 13 where Jesus goes up to Caesarea Philippi. It's the most northern region of Galilee. It's the most northern region he ever goes to do his public ministry. From this point on, he's going to start heading south, south towards Jerusalem, south towards the cross. And in fact, this is a very vital part for his disciples because he wants to know, what do you guys really think? So he begins in verse 13 by interrogating them about, hey, what do other people think? I just want to, what do you guys hear out on the street? Well, hey, Jesus, people really like you. They like you. Some think you might even be John the Baptist coming back. Hey, you might be Elijah. Just think about that. You might be Jeremiah or one of the prophets. This is what I would call is a, best way to put it, it is not really a compliment. It's a non-compliment compliment. This would be like telling an NFL player, you know what, if you came back and played JV football for our football team, you would light him up. <laughs> He's been talking to the man who made men, and they're saying, hey, people really think you're a good man. It's that argument with C.S. Lewis that say it's the, you can either say Jesus is crazy you can call him a devil, but you cannot call him a good man. You can't. It's kind of like telling an opera singer, you, you would be great in a karaoke down at the local bar. <laughs> We're talking about the Son of Man, so he gets very personal with the disciples. He says, who do you say I am? Verse 15. And I would ask you, how would you answer that question? Because how you answer that question determines everything for you. It determines not just what kind of life you're going to have, but it determines your eternity. Did you know when you go into eternity, before you get to enjoy eternity, it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, man dies once, and when they die, they face judgment. So when you face judgment, there's going to be two people. You... And Jesus. And nobody's going to be there with you. Your grandma's not even allowed in. Salvation is not a group effort. The Lord of all creation is going to evaluate you on those three stages. The first is justification. Justification is this moment in time when God looks at me and declares he or she is righteous. Because Heather believed, boom, the courts of heaven say, she is mine, and I will never leave her or forsake her. Justification, that moment when God claims you, is very personal. Look at verses 15, 16, and 17. So he asked them, who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So really we start 
Justification actually starts in verse 17, and then verse 16 is the consummation of it. Verse 17 we call revelation. Revelation is that moment in time when God opens your eyes, opens your eyes to see. The, the term revelation literally means the, the curtains are open. So imagine if this is a stage, and I'm going to do a play for you, and I start like this. I start like this. But let's say the curtains are closed. They're closed. So here I am waiting for my cue. I'm standing like this. But you don't know I'm standing like this. So I'm standing like this, then the lights come on and the curtains slowly open, and then you see me standing like that. You didn't know I was standing like that until the curtains open. Revelation is God opening your eyes for the first time, and you, you say, oh, Jesus is, oh, he's God. So there's two things included with Revelation. Number one is clarity. I once was blind, now I see. And certainty, what I see actually is. So first it has to be revealed. Then the second thing, well, I, I just remember when it uh, really hit me. I, growing up, I really had a problem with why is the world so screwed up? Because I was taught in school evolution. So evolution, men gets better and better and better, right? And I was taught philosophically progressivism, which means we progress. But everywhere I looked, it looked like everything's devolving, and people are not progressing. Even some of the most intellectual people I ever met are some of the most sexually perverse. What is going on? And then I open up the Romans 1, verses 18 to 32. And it says, God has revealed himself to the world. But they didn't want to acknowledge him as God, so they suppress the truth. They push it down, and they stand on it. And then they create their own truth. And then it says, so God gives them over to depraved minds. And I remember reading that, and I said, oh, it makes sense. That's revelation. But it has to be combined with receiving it. You have to have a heart that grabs it and embraces it. And that's what verse 16 is all about. Simon Peter answered, Jesus, you know what? You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. There is in, G in Peter's reply this not just understanding, but this wanting that he says, that's true for me. It's what I believe. There's also a little bit of joy to it. You could say... You could say, when you receive revelation, feeling will start coming with it. It's a feeling that I desire this. So, for instance, the book of James. James says, did you guys know demons have revelation? Demons know. Demons believe in God. But they tremble, which means they don't like the knowledge of God. So you could say the problem with demons is demons believe too. They see the truth as truth but they don't want the truth to be true. There's a lot of people like that, that they know things are true, but they don't want it to be true. Where when you embrace revelation and want it to be true, and you want to live in that, it's called embracing or appropriating it, that to me is the moment when the spark of life enters into you, God lays down the gavel and says, you are righteous. It's called justification. And it's very personal. You can't believe for anybody else. You can't. So, 2 Corinthians says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Are you? Do you know that you know that Jesus is your God? You're, or you could ask it like this. When you're all alone in bed at night, nobody's there with you. You take a comforter and you put it up to your chin and your head's resting on your favorite pillow. And the lights are out, and you can't sleep because your mind's going. In that moment, in that moment, does God exist for you? And not only that, is the God that exists, is he for you or not? Because I believe Revelation says, I know when I'm alone, when I even wake up early in the morning, I know God's with me. And I know God's for me. I do. I really believe it. Or let me give you a more current example. This one's for TJ. It's one of TJ's. I always go to this go-to for TJ. 
Did you ever watch Karate Kid? So Karate Kid, very end scene with Danielson. You might have seen Cobra Kai. Mr. Miyagi, his sensei, goes to Danielson and he's getting him ready for his last match. Danielson looks to Mr. Miyagi and goes, do you think I can win? Do you think I can win? And Mr. Miyagi goes, Danielson, that is not for me to answer. You must answer that yourself. Do you believe Jesus is king? You must answer that yourself. I want to go real quickly to take what I'm going to call just a rabbit trail real quick. I could, you, I could go, I could give four sermons on this, five, but I'm going to do it a quick five minutes if I can. But I'm going to ask you to think. So you're ready to think. Dan, you ready to think? You're an elder. He's shaking his head. No. Dan. Everybody else but Dan, and he's an elder. What is going on? I want you to look at me real quick. It's verses 18 and 19. Verse 18 and 19. Jesus says, so he's talking to Peter who just made this amazing statement. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Three topics to talk about. What in the world does it mean Peter's the rock? Or you could ask it like this. Does that mean Peter's the pope? That's usually what it ends up. First of all, I just want to give you a quick answer, no. In fact, the word Pope didn't come for about 700 years after that. And it doesn't work retroactively. Secondly, Peter was like all the other apostles. And in fact, Paul often approached Peter and rebuked him. You can read that in Galatians. So he wasn't this top guy that was smarter than everybody else. He was a man, but he was an apostle. So then, what does this phrase, you are the rock, mean? And on this rock, I'll build my church. There's two camps. One camp states that that phrase, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the foundation stone that the church is built on. Calvin and some other reformers would agree with that because even in 1 Corinthians 3.11 says that Jesus is the foundation. Other people would say, no, in the grammar, the way it's written, Peter is being directly talked to, and he is the rock, and on him, Jesus is going to build the early church, and there is some truth to that, too. He was the first one to preach. 3,000 people were added that number that day. Then it says in uh, Ephesians 2.20 that upon the teaching of the prophets and apostles, he's going to build his church. That's for you to worry about. I tend to lean a little bit more. He's going towards Peter. The reason why I didn't is because I didn't want to give any credence to this Pope idea. That's not, even, that's not even relevant. Second question. Keys to the kingdom. Look what he says in verse 19. I'll give you keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So are there some specific people when you confess your sins to them, do they open the doors of heaven for you? I'd say that's not what this is talking about. First of all, this is given to the church. The church are the assembly of believers. Those who believe brought together in a group, and I believe in this case, a local community, there is something unique about the church, that God's power and his presence resides. I think within the church, there is both provision, heavenly provision, and there's protection from the outside world. In fact, Jesus says, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with you. That's not a trite statement. That means when people gather in my name, I join you. I'm with you. We live in a day and age that has actually done everything it can to tear down the church and say it's just a man-made, institutional, patriarchal construct. It's not this incredible body of Christ or bride or building made by Jesus. If you want to see something very interesting, in the book of 1 Corinthians 5, 4, there's this person that was part of the church and he was sinning, and Paul says this, when you are assembled and I'm with you in spirit, the power of our Lord is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So there is something that Paul is saying, when you gather together in the name of Christ, he's there, and 
he answers your prayers. Third question, gates of Hades. So it says in the ESV, gates of hell, other version, gates of Hades. The Greek for this word hell means Hades or Sheol. Hades and Sheol is the realm of the dead. Realm of the dead, not the kingdom of Satan and his demons. A lot of people think this phrase means it's Satan and his army of demons that are going to be spewed out of the bowels of the earth and come after you, flying like crazy. That's not what this is talking about. What this is really about is Jesus is going to tell the church that they are going to gain victory over death. It will have no hold on you. And that's exactly what he's going to talk about here in a second. This is not really about overcoming demonic power battles. A lot of people like to make this like a sensational, you are fighting. The devil is alive, he is well, he has a lot of power, absolutely. But when it talks about Hades, it's saying, actually, do you know the only real weapon the devil has is to scare you with death. But Jesus destroyed it. And that's what this whole next part is. So it begins with a warning in verse 20. Look at verse 20. And this is something that you have to take very seriously. Because this is a very serious part of Scripture. Verse 20. Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Jesus was really excited about this statement. But then verse 20. He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. That word Christ means anointed king or Messiah. So he says, all right, that's a great statement, but don't go tell everybody about that. Why not? Why not? Why, why doesn't Jesus want them to go tell everybody he's the king? Because what you're going to see, the Lord's thoughts are not like our thoughts, and his ways are not like our ways. And watch verses 21 through 23. This is the reason why. And then I'll explain it to you. So verse 21. From that time, after the, their discussion, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter, now, now follow this. Now Peter hears this. I mean, we've heard this a lot because you've been in church a lot. But this is probably one of the first times it's really registered on Peter. Peter just said, you are the Christ. Woo, you're the, I'm, I'm going to be a rock. And then Jesus says, yeah, but Peter, I'm also going to die. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Look at verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He rebuked the Lord, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then verse 23 says, but he, meaning Jesus, turned and said to Peter, in the Greek, the idea is, is it's sort of like, in the Greek, the idea is that Jesus hears Peter's rebuke, and he, said, he takes off his glasses. He said, what did you just say to me, young man? You know, kind of one of those things. You ever have your kid talk back to you, and you can't believe it, or they say something bad to your wife? You say, what? You get over here right now. That's one of these moments. Jesus said, Peter, Peter, you don't talk to me like that. In fact, look what he says in verse 23. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter was just commended, and now he's rebuked. Is Jesus just an emotional basket cake? What is going on? Well, Jesus knows what's in the heart of every man. They want, and listen close, the heart of man, the natural heart of man, that is easily influenced by the devil. The natural heart of man wants the benefits of Christ being the king without sharing in his death. We want the health and prosperity without the denying yourself. Before resurrection, life can be experienced. The 
poison of sin and death needs to be extracted. R.T. France, who's a commentator, writes this about these verses. He says, Peter was ashamed to think that the king would be anything less than a success. I'm following you, Jesus, because we're going we're gonna to triumph. We're going to have victory. And so him, by using the word never, so other versions use never, ESV uses far be it from you. So by using the word never, he means that death is the greatest disaster ever to be contemplated, and it must be avoided. But Jesus rebukes Peter because he will not allow anyone to divert him from his mission. And what's his mission? To kill death by dying. So you can talk about making salvation or justification personal. It's one thing to believe Jesus is king personally. It's quite another thing to see him as a sacrifice for your sins. So you could say those who are really his understand this. And they embrace the cross. Those who are not See the cross as a failure and will avoid it at all costs. That was Satan's problem. Satan, he was proud and he didn't think he deserved anything less than winning. I'm special. I'm important. I deserve this. How dare you treat me like this? Milton said in Paradise Lost, here's Satan's heart. It is better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. It's like that old song. I may be going to hell in a bucket, but at least I'm enjoying the ride. Whereas the true saint would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the throne room of wickedness. So the question is, how do you know, how do you know, not only you are really saved, but how do you know Satan's not influencing you? The way you can tell Satan is influencing you is he always promises the easy road. You can have gain without pain. Jesus, however, points to the cross and says, follow me, which comes to sanctification. So justification is that moment you believe. Sanctification is from that moment until you go to heaven, the daily process of being more and more like Christ. And sanctification is also personal. He describes sanctification, verses 24 and 25. Listen to what he says. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, this is in the present tense, present active tense, meaning now and until I come back. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So you could say he has three what are called imperative statements. If you really are a believer, and I'm not talking about everybody else or the person two pews down, if you, you really believe this, these three things you're going to start practicing. You're going to deny yourself. And it's an imperative one. Jesus says, you want to follow me? You better deny yourself. Denying self, one writer said, denying self is to disassociate yourself from your own interests because your allegiance is now with Jesus. Jesus now rules instead of self. It's, it's how you identify yourself. So I'll make it real simple. Make it real simple. Are you a Christian or are you a Baptist Christian? Are you a Christian or are you a Reformed Christian? Are you a Christian or are you a Roman Catholic Christian? Are you a Christian or are you a white Christian? Are you a Christian or are you a black Christian? Are you a Christian or are you a conservative Christian? Are you a Christian or are you an LBTQ plus confirming, affirming are you a Christian or are you a homeschooled Christian? Tony Evans puts it like this. When you place a condition before the word Christian, you are more committed to fulfilling the terms of that condition 
then you are a following Christ. Deny yourself. The second part is take up your cross. Take, take up your cross isn't this, oh, I have a cross to bear. If you saw my kids, oh, the cross to bear. It's not the cross to bear. Taking up your cross is all about sacrificing your dreams, goals, desires to do the will of Jesus. It's sacrifice. The cross is the place where Jesus, I mean, if you think about it, Jesus was 33. He was in the prime of his life. He was the smartest man who ever lived. He was the most powerful man that ever lived. He had his whole life ahead of him. He could have done anything. You talk about somebody who deserved to have title. But you know what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, I'm going to lay all of that aside because not my will, but yours be done. Taking up your cross is laying aside maybe embarrassment or groups that used to wrongly influence you or some job that might be wicked or some pleasures that you enjoy because you'd rather do the will of God. It's called sacrifice. Then the following, the last one is just follow me. Follow me is that means faithful obedience in every season of life. Whether you win the lottery or whether you're in a hospital bed. Jesus is still worth following. He's worth it. And really the translation of worth it is worship. You can sum all this up in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. It's Christ who lives in me. Now this life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if you notice how that begins, I am. It's very personal. Not this group does, or they do, or my family, or my mom does, or my grandma. I am crucified in Christ. But are you? If you really believe, you will deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. Which leads us to the end game. It's called glorification. The end for which God invited you to follow him in the first place. We, if you're a business person, we like to term this as ROI. What's the ROI? What's the return I get for my investment? And we find this in verse 26. And this is... This is a verse that, oh boy, this has changed people's lives. This singular verse I have seen, if you ingest it and let it change, it will change your life. Verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So, return on investment is all about now, do you want the return right away, or do you want the return later? How, where do you want the return? Are you willing to wait for the return, or do you want the return now? If you want the return now, he's giving you an option. What is the return now? Well, you, get, you can gain the whole world, if you want, which means basically being consumed with possessions, power, and position. Now is the time to do that. Now is the time, now, now is the time to build bigger barns, to gain a following on social media. Now is the time to make big money, to get plastic surgery, to have your nicest car you've ever wanted. Now is the time to have the newest iPhone. Now is the time to expand your wardrobe and buy those $700 sneakers you've been longing for. Now is the time to get the neon blue 2022 Silverado pickup truck so I can pull my Boston Whaler 405 Conquest fishing boat with its sleek deep V-hole and wide beam. Now's the time to get it. Now's the time to get all the jewelry, nose rings, leather purses, gold coins, silver dollars. Now is the time to get a 1964 Eric Clapton Gibson guitar, wearing a velvet cowboy hat, get a yearly cruise pass on Carnival Cruise Lines, get a home theater to watch all of March Madness, NBA, NFL, MLB, college football, when the wife's gone, watch Pornhub. Now's the time! 
You can have it all. Now is also the time that refers to duration. It's this time period where moth and rust do corrode. It's this time period where we are wasting away. It's this time period we appear for a little while and like a mist we vanish away when the sun rises in the morning. So do you want it now? You can have, like really the way Jesus offered, you can have it now. That's okay. God has given you the choice. He had. You can go big, go big, man, or go home. Don't go halfway. Go all the way. Martin Luther would say, I'd rather have you go all the way. You're closer to God if you go all the way than if you just play this middle mamby-pamby road. Go all the way. You want to have a good time? Don't just drink one beer. Drink it all, man. Why not? Why not? It's interesting. Even King Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 11.9. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember, you must give an account to God for everything you do. And if you do choose now, Jesus says there is one there is a little conditional clause on the contract after the word now. You can find it in verse 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and, what's the next word? Forfeits. So this word forfeit, let me kind of put it in Willy Wonka jargon. That's how I think. You ever watch Willy Wonka? You know, you go to the chocolate factory and, you're supposed to obey the rules, and then you get all the, all the chocolate. Get everything. Well, Charlie Bucket goes to the end, of the end of the thing, and Willy Wonka has him in his office. You remember that? Everything's in half. Everything's in half. Willy Wonka looks at Charlie Bucket and said, It's all there. Black and white. Clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized. So you get nothing. You lose. So let me rephrase this passage in Jesus' language. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You gave up loyalty to Jesus to have everything now. So when you die, you get nothing. You lose. What, what do I lose? Your soul. So you know what you get later? Your soul. When it comes to your soul, Psalm 49, 7 and 9 says, The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. Peter says, It was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ. R.T. France says, Nothing else in all the world compares to the value of your singular soul. You can take all those things I read. You can take all of the things of the world. Compared to your soul, you are more priceless than everything. Everything. But this is hard to believe because we live in a throwaway world. We throw babies away in a garbage bag like they're a potato chip bag. We look at nice things, expensive things, Sparkly things. We say, now that's living, brother. And in our ignorant pride and gullibility, we're, we're willing to trade away a piece of ourselves for a sparkle. I just say, stop being fooled by the devil because he's busy making deals every single day with you. I, there's a song, there's a singer, I really like him, Coulter Wall. He's a kind of country singer, sing a little lower. He's got this song called, The Devil Wears a Suit and Tie. Listen to this phrase. It's exactly right. He said that, and he has a real deep voice. He says, don't you know the devil wears a suit and tie? I saw him driving down to 61 in early July. White as a cotton field and sharp as a knife. I heard him howling as he passed me by. Foolish, foolish was I. Damn my foolish eyes. Because that man's lessons had a price. Oh, sweet price. My sweet soul. Everlasting. My very own. 
eternal light. So we began this message with a question. Who do you say I am? And well, before you answer, I think I would want to know, what does Jesus say about himself? Does he ever say anything about himself? He does in verse 27. It's very interesting. He says in verse 27, he, first of all, he calls himself the son of man. Well, the modern skeptic's like, well, <laughs> son of man? He's just saying he's another human. Let's read the rest of it and see if you know where this comes from. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. Then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Does that remind you of anything? It's actually a reference to Daniel chapter 7, 9 through 14. Let me read that for you. Daniel 7. 9 through 14. Every Jew knew what he's talking about because they knew the Old Testament. Daniel 7, starting in verse 9, Daniel writes, as I looked, and the question is, do you believe what the Bible says? Because there's some passages, if you can imagine this and you believe this to be true, it's not just revelation, but I embrace this, this should rock you to your core. Actually, one writer said, if the Bible doesn't pierce you like an ice pick in the brain, you're not reading it right. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands, talking about angels, served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. This is the Antichrist. As I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. But their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This tells me one thing. Who I believe him to be is Jesus because he's one with the Father is the Ancient of Days. That has massive implications. And all I really can do is deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him because it's worth it. Who do you say he 